Mountain building. How actually mountains are built? Are they continue building? Did they done this for a long time? How old they are? And how mountains stop growing? Let's talk about that. One of the most intriguing about the mountains that they're all quite young in comparison with history of our earth. Most of the greatest mountains, the tallest mountain ridges on our planet, such as Himalayan, Andes, Alps, they've been building only during the last 50 million years tops. In other words, the dinosaurs were long dead before these so timeless seen mountain ranges began to rise up from the plain. More intriguing that only recently scientists start to understand how mountains are built. However, for a whole long history of the human being on our planet, people were fascinated about the mountains. There are a lot of legends about mountain tops, that the gods coming from there or living there, all the intriguing and interesting events like earthquakes, avalanches, volcanic eruptions, they're all related to the mountains. However, only since late 19th century we start understanding how the mountains are built. The process of mountain building in geology we call orogeny. It is a result of collision between plates. It involves thickening, uplift and displacement of the crust, with igneous activity folding and faulting, creating long scars of the Earth's surface. So before the plate tectonics come in place and we have more clear understanding how mountains are built, Geologists only understood that the mountains are growing, uplifting, and it's happening for several or even tens of millions of years. This process can stop, and erosion, the removal of material due to the weather, river streams, snow, and so on, making the mountains shorter, kind of flattening them down. Therefore, all the rocks which composed mountains of, they've been removed down into the ocean back again, where it's come from. However, in 1899, the famous geologist William Morris Davis developed a beautifully simple life history of mountains. We call it cycle of erosion. He suggested that mountains created in a brief and violent spasm uplift in the landscape, then a gradual decline through youth, maturity and old age by the forces of erosion, which I already talked about. Once these mountains become flat again and level with the other land around it, another spasm of upflit started the cycle again. Of course, we understand now that this is not very true. His idea was widely accepted. It was the most reasonable and elegant model for that time. It was kind of used by scientists till the plate tectonics developed in 1960s. Now we know there is a little bit more behind that. Therefore, in modern days, we understand the mountains can be built in different ways. The most ranges we have on our planet these days are built from the collision of two plates. It could be two continental plates, like in case of Eurasia and Indostan plates, building the huge Himalayas, or it could be collision of oceanic plate sliding under the continental lighter but yet thicker plate. For example, Andes, all the west coast of Americas is north and south. But saying this, remember that on the bottom of the ocean we have mountain ridges as well. And the famous mid-oceanic ridges, they formed actually by spreading the plates. Two ocean plates spreading apart and this uh, depression start filling with the basalt and the mountains are formed with some volcanic activity. See my video about plate tectonics for more examples and information about that. Similar, we have places on the continents, we call them rift zones, when in the past one plate start divided and the new ocean crust, future ocean plate start building. For example, eastern part of Africa or a big rift zone in Siberia, where the Baikal Lake, the biggest freshwater reservoir on our planet, is filling this depression of two plates moving apart. We also know mountains which built through the volcanic activity. We kind of call them places of hotspots. For example, big volcano of Fujiyama in Japan. Or we have single mountain peaks of large volcanoes like Taranaki in New Zealand. It seems like they're just standing in a very flat area, nothing around them. But we understand that the hotspot, the warm magma coming closer towards the subsurface in a stenosphere and it's caused the creation of the volcano. 
However, all the highest ranges of the land, like you, where two plates are moving together. Some I say it's like a rock rumpled against the wall. Converging plates crumple the rocks in between, forcing them to upwards and creating long folds all along the boundary. If you ever go to the mountains and you see some nice exposure, usually along the road, so when you're driving, look at the window, if not sitting on the driver's seat, of course, and you will see these nice folding features, which look like somebody put them there. This is all the forces of this crumble and folding, the layers of the rock one over the other, why the, for example, oceanic crust coming under the continental crust, and it starts folding this lighter and yet more viscous layers of continental crust surface. As the oceanic plate goes on pushing under the continent, these terrains pile up higher and higher in fractured and folded mountain belts. Think about North American Cordillera, which formed like that. Eventually, when this oceanic crust moved towards the continental crust, it became consumed by the mantle, and it's leaving the continent going towards the continent. This is one of the most violent collisions which we observe on our planet, and Himalaya is a great example of that. Two softer and lighter continental plates pushing against each other, and both of the surface materials start been folding against each other. It's a little bit tricky for geologists to understand the landscape there and the map geological feature. You have to do a lot of investigation. However, some mountains built in the past and now they just left alone. They're not uplifting anymore because continental plates, oceanic plates change the direction of movement and they slowly start reducing the height. So they're not uplifting, they're not active anymore and erosion, removing the material, helping to flatten them down. You know some of the mountain ranges, such as Appalachian Mountains in North America? They used to be formed when Africa and North America collide. Similar in Scotland and Norway, we have Caledonian Mountains, which formed in the same way back in the past, before even continents were as we know them now. Europe and North America at that time collide towards each other. Right now, if you visited Scotland or remember the landscape of Scotland, it's very rolled landscape with not such at all mountains. And unfortunately, they only become lower with time. But what about the erosion? There's an interesting relationship. For example, some mountains, like Himalayan, when they start building up and creating this huge Tibetan plateau with the highest mountains all around it. You know, in the northern part of the Tibetan plateau, we have seven southern peaks in the countries like Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, China. All the southern mountains are the highest peaks we can find on our planet right now. But this huge plateau, when it starts forming, it changed the local climate in that area. And the monsoon start affecting these mountains in whole India and other countries around it. So as a result, huge amount of water start falling down seasonally in that area and the erosion dramatically increase. We have constant uplifting of the mountains because one plate going towards the other with a high speed. At the same time, we have very, very high erosion rates, reducing its height. But even though we have such a high rates of erosion, the mountains are still uplifting, and scientists suggested about 5 millimeters of Himalaya every year growing higher up. Therefore, if you come back in 10 years to Himalaya and want to climb the highest peaks there, you will beat the previous records. Erosion also can invoke isostasy. This is when the mountains, which used to be heavier, they're a little bit kind of like beyond on the mantle on our earth, and they're a little bit sunk deeper with the roots going deeper into the highest levels of a stenosphere. When you start removing material from top, the crust become lighter and start a little bit uplifting because of adastasy, not because the mountains are uplifting by pushing plates. So when you're looking on the charts of mountains, the uplifts, you need to calculate that. You need to calculate natural uplift due to the plate tectonics, uplift due to the azastasy, and reduction of the height due to the erosion. An eventual number, like 5 mm in Himalaya, it will be that number after all the calculations. In the history of New Zealand mountains, Southern Alps, one of the most active places on our planet right now. If there was no erosion, then the Southern Alps will be as high as 20 kilometers only during the last two, three million years of the uplift. 
they would be as high as 20 kilometers. However, we have very, very high rates of erosion because all this western wind and snow and, and rain removing the material from it. A lot of earthquakes trigger landslides, slips formation which move a lot of material down through the rivers. And we have the mountain peaks not as high. Some data from the terraces around the mountain suggested the uplift rate was quite stable during the last 10 southern years, about 10 millimeters. Therefore, you can imagine what great the forces of erosion works around Southern Alps of New Zealand. So now I hope you have idea that mountain building involves a complex interaction between erosion, climate, tectonic movements and azastatic adjustment. There is so much to that. And in the mountains you can observe yourself the most greatest forces that operates on our planet.